All right. Well, thank you so much, Kathy, for the introduction and Susan for coordinating uh, our time together today. Uh, like Kathy said, my name is Scott McTagg. I'm uh, our uh, SVP of Talent Fit Solutions, which is all about making great hiring decisions for our clients. I'm working out of our Kansas City office. You may see my Patrick Mahone's bobblehead just uh, over there. Uh, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Chicago. Just wanted to let you know my daughter goes to DePaul. She's in a master's degree program there. I've uh, had a lot of time in Chicago, both uh, personally as well as professionally. So uh, uh, lo love me some Chicago. So it's a real pleasure for me to be talking with you folks today. So I'm going to go ahead and go off video just because it might be a little distracting while I talk and I'll take you through our presentation this morning. But again, very glad that you joined us. I know it's uh, early, uh, but we'll have a hopefully good time today. So I'm going to go again off video and we'll get started. Here's our agenda for today. As Kathy mentioned, this is really all about uh, how can we as leaders be most effective uh, through this time of crisis and coming out of it as well. Competency models are a way uh, that companies use to provide a foundation of what's expected of today's leaders. So we'll be talking about how competency models really define what's expected of today's leaders. We'll be doing a dive into leadership assessments. You know, why are these tools so effective for measuring, you know, how effective I am as a leader? How prepared am I as a leader in this, in this climate moving forward? The six leadership competencies are really the drivers of success. These are the areas that uh, many, many companies are looking for in their leaders. As we showed you that question just a minute ago, what are companies today looking for in their leaders? Uh, this will answer that question. These competencies, if they are present in new hires as well as in their current uh, executive ranks, uh, that's helping companies really get through this crisis and bouncing back. So what are the capabilities companies are looking for? Then we'll get really applied in terms of, okay, well, now that we know what the picture of success is, we now know what companies are looking for. How do we hire for that profile? And for you in this audience, how do you position yourself best to be very attractive uh, to be hired by companies? So that's a lens that, that I encourage you to be thinking about today. And then, you know, how can I develop as a leader? What can I do to prepare myself and develop myself as a leader um, so that when I have that next opportunity, I'm all over it and I'm really prepared? And then finally, what kind of an impact can I make uh, early on uh, as an executive in a new organization? What is my role coming in as a new leader in terms of making an impact and, and really having a, a, a strong first impression. And finally, we've got a really cool offer. Uh, we, we would like you to take advantage of this. Uh, this is a free behavioral assessment that we're offering you. As I go through the presentation, I'm gonna give you some examples of this actual assessment. If you would like us to send you the assessment for you to take, just simply text us at 33 seven 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 with the word exec fit one word all caps if you'll type that uh, in your text we will coordinate with you an assessment administration process and then what's also really nice is if you want me to talk through the results with you once you take the assessment uh, we can get on the phone and have a debrief of your results so really really encourage you to take us up on our offer today okay I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this concept, uh, given that you're you know, all experts in finance. This may not necessarily be a, a concept you're familiar with, but um, maybe it is. So let's talk further about what a competency model is. You know, how are we uh, and companies using competency models to set expectations? How does that help stabilize everything uh, human resources is working on to bring new leaders on and develop them and you know how does a, a competency model help a company adjust through these changing times and there's a graphic i want to show you that uh, will hopefully explain these questions okay so let's talk about this graphic real quick uh, let's start at the bottom establishing your company mission vision and values 
as the foundation of what you're uh, putting together from a people strategy is, is very, very important. So who you are as a company, uh, what's happening is human resources is building in uh, what's really unique about their company and culture and mission and vision into the hiring process. So this is a really important point. Companies are not just looking for highly talented and skilled finance executives. They're looking for those skilled executives who fit uniquely within their culture. And, and that's an important thing to be thinking about today is how can I position myself, not just functionally as a finance leader, but to be you know, a good fit within a particular culture that I'm interested in in terms of my next opportunity. So uh, one, one, you know, every culture is different. So fitting within a culture is equally as important as fitting within a job. So as we build up from the ground, uh, we then get to the competency layer of, of our chart. So what I wanted to communicate here is once a company defines the competencies, they're going to be interviewing for those competencies and assessing for them, developing for them, managing performance around those uh, performance expectations. So just wanted you to know this audience that companies are really smart about building that profile of success, <clears throat> excuse me, because it's really equally as important for, comp for you know, a company to make sure that decision is right for them, but it's equally important for the individual to make sure that that decision is right for the individual. So, you know, it's really a, a company person fit that goes both ways. And this structure helps accomplish that because if they, if the company knows the target, they're going to be really dialed in to assessing and interviewing for that target. And it just helps companies hire people who are going to be closer to the business. So I think the big takeaway from this graph is, you know, don't forget to interview for the culture as much as you're interviewing for the job. So assessments are tools that companies use to make the most accurate and predictive hiring decision possible. So we're going to dive into, you know, why are these useful and helpful tools? How do they work? Where do they add the most value? And, and how can they help paint the picture of a leader who is prepared or not in, in the climate that we're in today? So there's a company called Aberdeen Group that is an expert in studying assessments. And, and they found there's really six areas that define the, the power of assessments. But, you know, it's really interesting being in finance, you know, and all about the numbers. We wanted to share that, you know, companies who do this really well and use assessments in their hiring practices and in their development practices, there was a study that they conducted with over 250 companies, and they found that those that were really um, practicing sound assessment practices had almost 40% lower turnover than companies that did not use assessments. And that's pretty astounding because there's been a lot of studies that show that, um, you know, when an executive that's a high performer leaves an organization, you know, it's, it's very, very expensive. And some numbers are, you know, 100% of salary, they really range. But the key is when you lose good people, it's very, very expensive and devastating to the business. So anytime you can reduce your turn turnover, it has both a financial as well as a, uh, an intangible impact on the business and, and tangible in other areas. Also, we found that Companies that practice assessments in their everyday performance and everyday talent management had almost a quarter of their performers exceeding performance goals. So not only when you use assessments will your people will your people more likely stay in a role, they're going to perform better in role. So why why is that? Well, number one, assessments are scientifically proven effective. They predict performance. I've, I've spent my entire career developing and implementing assessments. 
and the rigor that go that goes into developing a scientifically sound assessment is really uh, astounding. Uh, people, you know, lay, lay people don't really realize the in, intense statistics that, that go into building an effective assessment tool. And hi, I'm going to pause here because I think we have a question, Kathy. Okay, here's a question. Kathy, I'll go ahead and read it, but okay. thank you for uh, letting me know. How down in the management chain are companies requiring assessments before hiring? Great question. Uh, E.g., is it down to a control level or account manager? Absolutely. Assessments go from the top executive C-suite all the way to the hourly ranks. In fact, I've started my career building hourly <laughs> and management assessments. So I started at the hourly ranks. I now work uh, at the executive uh, level, but assessments work all the way up and down the chain. Great question. Okay, good. So um, I'll jump off the video here and continue. So predictive, a lot of science goes in uh, to building these assessments and that's why they work. I, I was providing a debrief with a, a client the other day and he was really the president who was trying to make a hiring decision for two VP candidates who we had assessed. And I had actually written the, the assessment report. When I provided the debrief, he, he actually s congratulated us for how accurate the assessments were. He had, this president, known these two gentlemen for 15 years. And he said that the assessments pegged uh, these guys uh, as well as uh, what he's known them to be for 15 years, which is pretty cool. Pretty cool. Uh, descriptive assessments describe who people are in terms of their behaviors, tendencies, and capabilities. So it paints a picture. So as a, a hiring manager who's hiring a CFO, they want as clear and detailed a picture as possible of the candidate to make the most informed hiring decision. And, and that's one reason why companies use assessments. Uh, alignment, assessments help make sure that you're hiring for the, the right characteristics to support the business. Protective, companies don't realize sometimes that you're actually more legally defensible in using assessments than in not using assessments. And one reason is because of the science as well as these last two bullet points. It's a standardized process that treats every candidate the same and it's objective because it doesn't assess any kind of um, area of subjectivity or bias. So these six reasons um, are, are why we really have seen assessments work a, a lot of great uh, wonders with our clients. And, and over the years, I've just seen companies be just so successful when they use assessment programs, uh, really all up and down the organization to the, the point made earlier. So let's dig into the profile that we want to share with you today. There are six leadership competencies, and these come from a, an assessment called the Leadership Temperament Index. And that's actually the assessment that uh, we'll provide to you if you send us your text. But here are the six areas that we're going to dive into. And what I really encourage you to do today is Picture yourself in these six areas. How do you feel you're best situated based on your personality around these six areas? So be thinking about that and be thinking about, hey, maybe there's one or two of these areas where I need to work on a little bit. And I'm going to give you a, a, a nice tool to do that later in the presentation. Let's dig into these six. Change management, resilience, creativity, strategic capacity, influence and collaborative orientation. This one's a big deal. Um, obviously, this, <laughs> these last three months have created a great deal of change. So change management really ranks highly in the areas where companies are, are focusing on and hiring their next level executives. Because it's the, the ability to deal with and lead through expected and unexpected, as we've had, environmental and paradigm shifts. So those who are 
high end change management are those that can adjust, they can alter the course based on the conditions that are presented, and ultimately um, handle the, the complexities of what's not known in the business to come. So again, change management is one of those really important areas for you as a leader to be really focused on and develop if you feel that's an area that you could really uh, be more effective in. Change management. Resilience. Let's look at that. It's how you can persevere. It's your ability to persevere in the midst of difficult challenges. So how do you get through what we're going through today? You know, how can you handle the, the stress and the obstacles that are presented in your everyday work life. So if you're highly effective in resilience, you can handle the pressure that we're dealing with more effectively than others. I'm gonna pause here because it looks like we have some more questions. Kathy, do you wanna help us uh, get, get through these next two questions? We have one, um, are those six listed in priority order? Great question. I, Here's, here's the way I look at this. I rank change management one and then all the other five as two. Because if you're an effective change agent, you'll be more effective in this climate than, than not. So I would put change one and those other five, number two. Great question. Great question. We have an, a third question that's come in. You want to take it now, Scott? I would like to get a better okay. understanding of leadership. Yeah, so this is, yeah, this is like three yeah. questions in one. I'd like to get a better understanding of leadership assessments. What is a typical leadership assessment and report? Why don't we answer that first one first? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be able, I'm going to actually show you one. So okay. you'll, you'll actually see an assessment report here, here in a moment. And, and we'll then, talk and about then, how to I assess. So I, I feel like we're going to answer those questions. We're going to cover, I think we're going to cover yeah. these. Okay, yep. we'll come back. And if we don't, we'll come back and circle back uh, in a little bit, all right? All right, Robert, let us know if we answer your questions moving forward. Thank you. Okay, excellent. So again, the ability to bounce back, resilience. Our next one is really important, creativity. So how can we as leaders think outside of the box to develop new and unusual solutions to, to issues, problems, and strategies. A little bit more on creativity. You know, if, if you can really force yourself to look at a problem from a different angle, uh, you're ultimately providing more for your organization. And so just really encourage you all to, to say, hey, am, am I really, being that innovative leader that my or that the my future organization needs for me creativity and innovation so there's a lot of complexity and ambiguity in the world these days and those with a higher strategic capacity are able to navigate through the complexity of of today uh it also is related to um how you handle complex problems it supports your innovation, and it really um, essentially helps you deal with all the ambiguity that, that's present, uh, present today. Influence, how do you impact people? What, what kind of a lasting impression do you make when you interact with individuals and your new team? This is a really important category when you think of the um, early presence you have as an executive in the organization because it's uh, the ability to connect with others and use that connection to lead. You, you've probably all met people that just, when, when you meet them, you just wanna hear what they have to say. Um, those are people with strong influence um, skills as it's related to the assessments because ultimately those who are higher in influence make other people feel important. And, and that's really what we're looking for in our leaders of today. And finally, collaboration or collaborative orientation. How do we work with others? Um, because this is the ability to create work in effective and synergistic, synergistic teams and support and encourage teamwork. So how, 
how can I as a leader bring people together, get people on board with my mission, build important relationships, and bond closely with my, my team members. So um, this particular uh, competency is, is a, a picture of a leader who's a team leader, not one of those leaders that's more of a command and control type personality. So we, we're, we're really looking for leaders who are strong mm -hmm. and collaborative in their approach. Okay, now we have our six competencies. The question a moment ago was around how does this show up around assessment reports and how do we use it for hiring? So why don't we go ahead and take a look at that now. Leader selection, how are companies leveraging these competencies for selection? What, what can I do as a leader to meet the challenge and meet the criteria that companies are establishing for selecting their next leaders? And what are their other tools? Kathy mentioned earlier about uh, interviewing. We'll, we'll talk about the power of target, targeted interviewing because again, you, you as a viable candidate you may be assessed, but you'll definitely be interviewed. And we want to show you really what that lens looks like in terms of companies who are uh, going through this interview process with their next executive. So we'll have a chance to look at that. It's uh, our business is all about prediction because what you see above the surface is only a small portion of who people really are. That's what this graph is communicating. Who we are as individuals is, is below the surface. Sometimes it's hard to see and assess in a typical interviewer, interview, excuse me. People are really, really effective at presenting themselves in a certain way. That's what's above the surface. We need tools that go below the waterline to understand who is this particular candidate in terms of their values, their capabilities, their characteristics, their character, because I wanna know all that so I can make the best hiring decision possible. <clears throat> it's our job to help provide the tools that help the prediction be more accurate and consistent time and time again. The process of implementing an assessment is a, is a rigorous one because ultimately the assessment needs to be aligned with the role as well aligned with the business and the culture for that particular company. What we do to establish that is we conduct at the very bottom here of these stair steps a job analysis. Essentially that is a process where we understand what's required for success in a role. And we do that through interviews of current employees and other processes, because ultimately we need to understand what the, those re role requirements are, which is that next step up in the, in the stair step here that then tell us, okay, we know what is required for the role, now, what tools are we going to use to help measure those role requirements and the behaviors that relate to success? We align an, an assessment, we create an interview, which we call targeted interview, and we'll get into that here in a moment. We have a summary report that we provide to the hiring leader to communicate, is this particular candidate situated around your role, role requirements to be a possibly good fit or a questionable fit. And I'll show you an example of that here in a minute. And then we also like to get on the phone with our clients to walk them through the results of the executive level assessments that we conduct. If it was an assessment done to the earlier question at an hourly individual contributor accountant level, manager level, that would be a report by itself more than likely, but at the executive level, we go a little further and provide a, a debrief because if there's some there, there's high stakes in, in making that hiring decision. So the process is a little bit more intensive for us helping the hiring managers. We do a, a debrief with those executive level candidates. 
So six steps that get us uh, through the assessment process. Let's look at what a report uh, example um, communicates. Uh, I'm going to pause again. Kathy, looks like we have a couple of questions. Oh, that sounds no. good. <laughs> oh, Jerry, we hear a lot about the term critical thinking skills. How is that concept included in your six leadership competency models? Well, it's, it's communicated in this report example, but it's not one of the six competencies. But it's very, very important. We're communicating the six behavioral competencies that are important to success. Critical thinking is, is a, a different, different ball game. I'm gonna go off video and show you how we communicate critical thinking skills. Great question. Okay, down here there's what we call a capacity measure. We use a tool called the Watson Glazer. The Watson Glazer is well used for executive level assessments for hiring. And so we actually put a, put a good deal of weight behind someone's score in this Watson Glazer because critical thinking is an absolutely important component to success in an executive role we would include the Watson Glazier often with a behavioral assessment, which produced those six leadership competencies. Those two tools together are very powerful for um, our executive assessment practice. When you look down at this overall fit, you can see that a low critical thinking really brought down what were some pretty good behavioral measures because again, if you don't have at least a, a solid threshold of critical thinking, some of these behaviors really won't, will, you'll still probably fall short because you just don't have that critical thinking ability to complement your stronger behavioral profile. Here are our six and how they show up in our report. This is an example of a scorecard report that we provide one of our clients and we customize this report for each of our clients so it will look a little different from client to client uh, we like this structure um, so we'll probably continue using the structure but the, the content in here is all customizable but here are six leadership competencies you can see down here on the left side so what we're doing for this particular client is reporting out the leadership competencies as a strength area, are they solid or is it a gap? And we actually provide some percentiles as well. So there's a, there's a lot of detail from a numerical standpoint as well. We provide a graphical um, um, representation there with those um, shaded colors and then the content of what their strength areas are in each of the areas, gaps, concerns that you may have for this uh, potential new leader and an overall summary. This is an example of a report that integrates both the assessment as well as the interview because we will have conducted an interview prior to creating this report. So for pre-hire selection decisions, this is a great, very useful tool for helping the client understand both behaviorally as well in that critical thinking area, understand is that a good fit for uh, my role as well as for my organization. Again, this is customizable, but we wanna make sure that we're communicating the relevant data and this uh, format is, is something our clients really like, very useful. So this is what we would uh, provide as an example for our clients around the hiring portion of, of the talent management life cycle. We mentioned interviewing, I wanna to touch on that um, briefly. Targeted interviews are complementary tools with the assessment and they really help you know, connect dots because I may have some assessment data in front of me. I wanna know when I kind of conduct this interview, is that assessment 
coming alive in the interview? Am I seeing some of, hearing some of those behaviors come out in my interview? Targeted interviews assess values, meaning how is this connect, a candidate connected potentially with our culture? We then dive into the competencies. So we have questions that we would create that uh, help the hiring manager understand really where that competency skill set comes alive. And then hardware capabilities. From the interview standpoint, does the candidate have the capacity and character to be successful? We, we would be a third party example uh, of, as it sh shares in this bullet point. Very, it's more and more common that companies use third party companies uh, because they're, they have that objective lens and have the assessment expertise to add data insights to the hiring process. And then we believe in a multiple interviewer process. We, we want to make sure that there's at least you know, two, three interviews that are conducted, and then the interviewers will share that data ultimately to help make the, the most informed hiring decision possible. And here's an example of some questions in a couple of different um, areas. Politically savvy is a competency for a particular client of ours. Navigates ambiguity. Again, that's another competency for one of our clients. Questions for each of the co competencies, behavioral questions, and then what, what are we listening for in the answers? And then down here, we have a nice little scoring grid. But before I walk you through that, looks like we have another question. What are your thoughts about cross-functional panel interviewers by the prospective employer? I, I, I'm a big fan of cross-functional panel interviewers, interviewers and interviews. As long as everyone's dialed in, you know what you're assessing for, and you don't just have a, a bunch of interviewers asking questions because they're, those are their favorite questions that they like to, to ask. So if you're gonna have a panel interview, make sure that the interviewers know what they're going to be assessing for. And then once that's done, just make sure that you come together based on the answers uh, provided by the candidate and you, you're all in consensus with what you felt the candidate performed well and where the areas of concern are. Kathy, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but that's that's my thought. Great. Good question. I agree, question. Scott. I'm not I'm I'm not clicking on and off this video quick enough here, obviously. No, I I agree. I mean, certainly, you know, the trends we've seen, and, and I know all you folks on the phone, you've sat in the interviewer's seat as well as participating in that. When when we look back in time over the, you know, how people interviewed, and I used to say to people, there's only really three main questions. Does the person have the skills and the ability to get the job done? And your resume is going to demonstrate that. That's what's going to get you in front of them. The second one is, can they do it? You know, are they a can-do person? Are they going to do that? And then we coach you, and I know you're all very good at practicing your star and star statements, you know, quantifying with numbers on the deliverables you do. And the third question is, is this person going to fit? And you know, we used to train people, and I'm sure you and your organizations have gone through behavioral interview training as well as conducted behavioral interviews and participated in those. But today what we're seeing, and certainly, you know, when we talk about the average tenure of CFOs and people in C-suite roles being 18 to 36 months, you know, what's not working and sometimes that's the fit piece and so as scott's talking about you know this fit this cultural fit is so critical and important in addition to you fitting with that role so we're seeing much more of an appetite on the part of companies to want to go through some type of formal assessment like this and i think as we continue to go through this um and work in a remote environment and onboard remotely, it's only gonna increase. So, you know, we wanted to, you know, 
we thought this would be a great topic just to kind of tee up and get your wheels turning how important this is so whether you lead this or how you participate in it you feel like you've got the skill set to do so that's a great point kathy when when i'm interviewing i'm looking for candidates who ask questions about the culture and that demonstrate that they've done research about the company and the culture uh, again, culture is a is a really important part of this uh, person company fit beyond just skill set. Absolutely, so I would encourage you to learn as much about the companies that you're considering as possible. Find out you know what they're all about, and then when you're interviewing, make sure that you're uh, engaging them in questions around the culture. Great, great. All right, so. Again, this is an example of, of an interview structured format that companies are really moving more towards to be consistent in the way that they're interviewing. And we just picked a couple of examples here for you to, to understand. Uh, but again, companies are really getting smarter about using these kinds of tools, sorry, to make the best informed hiring decision possible. Wanna share real quickly some case studies where this really works. Here's one for a hospitality company. And when we started working with them eight, nine years ago, they said, we're really bleeding around in this turnover area in our executive ranks and we need help. With the use of assessments and interviews, just like I've shared, very similar format to what I've shared with you, we've been able to help them uh, increase the kind of retention that they want by 45%. And from an ROI standpoint, that, that is several, several hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions, when you look at how expensive executive turnover is. And again, everything we can do to help reduce that turnover uh, has a, a very direct impact on the bottom line. Other areas that come with that are engagement, performance, uh, and, and really helping build this particular client up as a, a employer of choice. Another couple of quick examples in a nonprofit, we helped uh, a, a Dallas nonprofit achieve some really uh, audacious goals. And they were really only able to achieve those through a strong executive team. Uh, Joe and our executive assessors, Joe is our, our president at CMP and executive assessors work with this client to make sure that the board and the executives were the right level and mix of talent. And they were able to achieve the largest capital campaign in the state of Texas history. Pretty awesome. We're really proud of that in that way. And then finally, in, the, in healthcare, uh, such a big industry today. We we worked with uh, and are still working with this client to help them again in this executive turnover area. And we have decreased their turnover through the use of these more scientific tools and over five years um, really helped them in some key uh, financial outcome areas. Three examples, three different industries, all using a similar best practices approach with assessments and targeted interviewing to get some strong uh, bottom line ROI impact from better better tools and processes. And that's really what we're looking for. Now you've been probably sitting here wondering, okay, Scott, how does this, and Kathy, how does this affect me? So let's answer some questions. How can I develop my leadership capabilities to be you're really as well prepared as I can. How can those competencies be leveraged around my development? And what's a nice, useful tool to help me develop in the areas where I need to focus on? I'm gonna give you a really nice, simple way to help structure your development. What you're seeing here on this screen comes from the actual Leadership Temperament Index report that you would receive if you take us up on our offer to complete the free assessment. This is a competency wheel. Let me walk you through this. Again, this is not produced 
by CMP, this report. The other one I showed you uh, was a custom report that CMP created. This report comes directly from the LTI. It's called the Self Insight Report. Around the outside of this wheel, there are four what we call leadership preference areas. There's the director, counselor, coach, and strategist. These four preference areas help you as an individual understand what is my general mindset when it comes to dealing with um, people, processes, and problems. Am I one, one who will, you know, take charge of the situation and direct folks? Am I one who's really more of a counselor? I'm going to help you figure it out. I'm, I'm going to teach you and coach you and train you, or I'm going to really think about the big picture as a strategist. This assessment identifies where you fall most prominently in these four areas. It will give you a score of where you are in each of these four areas, but it's most important to know which is your most prominent preference area. In this particular case, the most prominent one are both director and counselor because you can see that there's more green scoring in those two preference areas than there is with a coach and strategist type preference area. As we get further into the wheel, we have the leadership competencies. I've circled the six that we're focusing on today, but with this LTI report, you actually have 12 competencies, which are those that are listed here, emotional strength, influence, et cetera, around the wheel here. So again, we're focusing on 12 competencies. Six of those are the real important ones that we're focusing on uh, for our presentation today. What is provided within the competency report are percentiles. This 72 percentile score right here tells me that I'm at a level where 28% of the benchmark group scored higher in this area than I did, but I scored at, at the 72 percentile level, which means that, you know, 71% of the benchmark group was lower than me. So a 72 really isn't necessarily, we don't, we don't want to call that a bad score. We want to say that that's an area of potential development because it's a, you're scoring a little lower in comparison to the executive group. However, if you look at these areas in blue, and in green, I'm really scoring well above uh, my, my peer group in these areas. And the way to really focus on this from a developmental standpoint is to say, hey, based on this data, I'm really knocking it out of the park when it comes to operational capacity, emotional strength, influence, and resilience. Those are areas where I'm really leveraging my natural orientation, and it, it, it helps me be successful. These blue competencies, leadership drive at 81%, that's still a really solid score. That's an, that would be considered still a strength, but not to the degree that it is a strength if you're in the green zone. And then again, yellow indicates a potential gap area. When you get this report back for yourself, we'll help you understand uh, what this means relative to you. The report provides deep definitions into each of these 12 categories. And it really goes into detail around, you know, what are my behaviors rel relative to this data and relative to being, uh, me being an effective leader in today's environment. We wanna give you a nice tool. This is a great walk away for you and and Kathy I'm sure we we can send this slide deck out, out to everyone and you could print copies of this but I really like this tool because it's a simple 
but very effective way to drive development in key areas. As I mentioned a moment ago, we communicate strengths, blue areas, which we call solid, and then the yellow areas are potential gaps and risks. A really practical way to use that data is to say, okay, well, based on what I just saw in my report, what should I stop doing? What are the behaviors that are potential derailers for me? And I really should consider stopping or really pulling back the reins in a particular area. From a development standpoint, we would encourage you to use that data, use what you know to be true about yourself from other feedback, and list a couple of behaviors that you really need to consider dialing back or stopping altogether. The start is really what am I not doing that I need to start doing either differently or just start doing because I haven't been doing it effectively. Let me give you an example. Early on in my career, I was an individual contributor and that's what I was, I thought really set out to, to do in my career is to be uh, the best consultant possible. Well, in the early 90s, I, I began building business. I created some new assessments and all of a sudden I had to build a team. I went from individual contributor to manager literally overnight. So I had to say, what do I, what should I stop doing? And what should I stop, start doing? In my example, I had to stop trying to be everyone's friend because I'm no longer their peer. I'm now their, their boss. And I need to really be thinking about my relationship relative to my new role. What should I start doing? Well, I better start evaluating performance a little more critically because I'm in, I'm by nature an accommodating person. I'm very service oriented, but that keep that kept me, excuse me, from being the critical evaluator of performance that I needed to be. And even more so, I disliked confrontation and what that, translated into as a manager is I wouldn't address tough performance issues. I would let things slide. And so I had to really start <clears throat> becoming a more tough-minded manager. Otherwise, I was not going to be effective. And then finally, there's this continue. What can I continue doing that's working for me? And in, in, in my case, I developed great relationships. I, I, knew, <clears throat> I knew what performance uh, looked like. I just needed to start implementing those standards with my employees. I really like this tool uh, because it, it helps you say, what are the one or two behaviors I should stop doing or dial back? What are a couple of behaviors I should start doing or start doing differently? And what should I continue doing because that's helping me be successful? <clears throat> if <clears throat> without the data, that we would provide in the assessment, you could take this right now and start working on it. We'd love for you to do that. But again, if you have the assessment data in hand, it, it would help this process become more effective and, and more useful for you as an individual. So stop, start, and continue. A real nice, easy, but effective develop, development method that we would encourage you to use. And finally, as you get your new opportunity, we want to we help you maximize your early impact. So as you come into the organization, how can you really make a wow impact on the company and create real ROI for your new company and position yourself to take on new challenges? Let's take a look quickly. We've got about four minutes. I just want to walk you through quickly what are some key steps you can take? This study just really emphasizes the importance of effective executive integration. And here are, some se here are seven key steps that will help position you as a new executive in your new organization. Under, number one, understand operations. I would also add uh, 
understand the culture and the mission and vision and values of the organization. Really immerse yourself in the operational side of your new business. Understand what's to be expected. What are some of those ground rules? Ground rules can be spoken or unspoken. I worked in a data center company and there were a lot of unspoken ground rules that, that took a little work for me to understand. But the earlier I understood them, the better I was able to get on board. Know your team, spend time getting to know your folks. Assessment tools are great um, and useful ways to understand uh, who your team is. So um, a lot of our clients use us to hire their executives and those executives use us to hire their team and develop their team. It's really a trickle effect. Align with your key stakeholders. Who are the key decision makers and influencer, influencers in the organization? Knowing that early on and developing those key relationships uh, sure do set you up uh, for success early on. Again, back to the culture, engage with the culture. I would encourage you to find out how they're involved in the community. Who are the um, recipients of their uh, budget around uh, nonprofits? Who are they giving back to? Understand really what, what is this organization all about from a culture and, and community and philanthropic standpoint. That's great to know. Strategically, where's the company going and how do I fit in and how can I, as a finance leader, drive that strategy? And then finally, creating that 60, 90 day plan. I Don't wait for your boss to create that plan for you. They're more than likely not going to unless you initiate it. I would encourage you, strongly encourage you to own your development get in early on in the organization and have the conversation about how you can be more effective and take initiative in putting that uh, move forward <clears throat> plan together, really all around your priorities, but also what you're working on to develop as a leader. All right, we are getting close to the end, but I'm still we are getting uh, available close. for questions. We have a couple more questions and we'll stay on to take these if some of you have to jump off. Scott, thank you so much. And <laughs> a lot of information. I mean, you know, I know there's a lot. I know. Well, the one good thing for me about these virtual kind of Zoom meetings is that when we're presenting heavy data, and I know all you finance people out there, you like to see the data. When you're seeing, <laughs> you know, when you're able to see it on a small screen like this, I think it's a little bit easier. And we'll certainly make the presentation available to you. But just a couple, we've got a couple questions here I want to get to. Um, how can assessment programs be tailored for positions such as the CFO? Uh, good question. Um, there's a couple of ways that come to mind. One, uh, in the assessment, there's a process called benchmarking, and benchmarking helps us through the collection of a lot of data, align the scoring for particular roles. Um, so taking a, a sample of executives in the finance area and benchmarking them on the assessment is one way. And then the targeting interview would be the other. Having the targeted interview really focus on those key areas uh, of um, success as a finance leader or a CFO uh, would be another way to, to really customize, I'll just use that word, the, the hiring process for a CFO type position. Thanks. Question. And the next one is, how can I, what can I do about my blind spots? How do I develop <laughs> what I can't see to your iceberg, you know, graph yeah. point? So how do I see what's below the surface, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what I don't know. I, <laughs> the, the, Best thing, you know, in real estate, the key is location, location, location. Uh, my answer to that question would be feedback, feedback, feedback. Uh, get as much information from those who know you well as possible to try to uh, uncover those blind spots because you can only work on what you know. And so feedback is the best tool to know what blind spots you have because that's the starting point for development. Thanks. Oh, looks. 
Kathy, it looks like we have a couple more questions. That oh, came we do have a couple. Here. Yeah. yeah. So let's see. Those great questions. Those, those are, are thank questions. you. We've got a lot of nice thank yous coming in oh, here. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. So this is a lot of work. How can the individual executive find a mentor to help out? Like a recruiter or someone in my own personal network, or maybe even hire CMP to help. Well, I, I think you, that's Jerry for teeing that up. <laughs> Kathy, I think that's a conversation between you and Jerry. What do you I think? I think so. Okay. <laughs> and then we I, we've got one more that I want to get to, obviously, that came in that says, what mistakes do executives sometimes make in their first 30 days? Oh, wow. Mistakes. So, yeah, looking back, and you know what, and that's a good, obviously that would be a great poll question for me to go out and ask all of you yeah. sometime as well. I, I think one thing comes to mind is they don't ask enough questions. They, they're too <clears throat> passive. They, they, they expect everything to be given to them versus being the one to really ask the questions and immerse themselves. So I think one mistake is executives can be a little kind of passive and asking the, the important questions early on. Um, that's the that's the first thing that comes to my mind is, is yeah, I, I they don't ask enough I think that's great. I mean, I think we all need to be bolder. I mean, that's something I say yeah, bold. There you go. every day, step up and be bold. And let me just double check and make sure I think, you know, oh, thank you all for the nice comments in here. Oh, thank you, you know. Jared. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm glad many of you thought this was actionable. I thank you for dialing in. What I would encourage you to do is to text. Scott, do you want to throw that uh, slide up again with the text? Oh, the yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Put that on the yep. first slide as we're dialing go. out here. There you go. Thank you. Okay, so I yep. would encourage you, you know, it's an awesome offer and nobody does it better than Scott. I'm so proud to have him on my team. Thank so you. if you'd like to take the assessment, you know, it's not only getting that graphic report, which you saw, but you get the debrief. So you're going to get some pre-executive coaching here. And um, and we'll have fun with it, y'all. And you'll I, have I fun. Promise. I'm Absolutely. not going to put you on the couch. Uh, right. This will be a, a nice business conversation and we'll have a, we'll have a good time with it. All Hopefully right. we'll make some important connections for you to uh, help dial, dial you in more as an effective executive. But again, we'll have a good time with it. Thank you. All right. <laughs> sure. Well, with that, we, you know, we ran a little over. Thank you, Susan, for hosting you, Susan. and putting us together. I do. Before we go, I want to mention our next program. So we, you know, typically uh, the CMG is not met in person in July since we're meeting in the virtual environment, and most of us won't be traveling obviously for the holiday. We do have a meeting scheduled for July second. And the topic is maximizing your influence and impact. And that's with another CMP team member, Marilyn Graves, who some of you have met and went through emotional intelligence with her. But dial in for that and more details to come. And then on August 6th, we're bringing in Laurel Bellows, who's an employment attorney to talk about, you know, the new world of um, employment agreements and um, negotiating and, and how to move forward with those. So with that, thank you all uh, for dialing in and reach, obviously here's my email and Scott's, if we can help you in any way, or you know, I'm always open to having a conversation or helping you with your networks as well, please reach out.